NFR Extra follows all your favorite cowboys, interviews legends of rodeo, and talks to the best of country music. Follow Nevada Caldwell, Rylan Bentley, and Steve Godert every week as they delve deep into the stories behind the road to gold in Vegas at the National Finals Rodeo. It's revealing, comedic, and sometimes emotional. Find it on Spotify or anywhere you listen to podcasts. NFR Extra, all dirt, all rodeo, all year. NFR Extra, Episode 62. Today, self-made country music mainstay Aaron Watson joins us. And boy, was this a conversation to say the least, Mr. Goder and Brylin. Whoa. Yeah, for sure, man. That was like, uh, I mean, you think about Aaron Watson and obviously South Point Hotel and Casino gold buckle ceremony comes to comes to mind. And, uh, you know, without really being a real hardcore Aaron Watson fan, the stuff that he opened up about, maybe you would know that. But man, that was like, it'll kind of set you on your heels. And then you talk about the emotional roller coaster that we all went on from the laughter, a little bit of tears almost, and... Just a genuine person. Everything about them. Yeah, yeah, and I just kind of want to throw it out there. I mean, like, there's a couple of things here covered, right? Parenting and the pandemic. Things that you probably wouldn't expect sitting down with a country music artist like Aaron Watson, but uh, parenting in a pandemic, being a parent, and the true emotional toll that it can take uh, through that process. And, uh, you know, someone who, man, he's really connected to his music and his fans. Right? Yeah. Right? I mean, For sure. Well, and, and like you said, the self-made, I mean, like he writes the songs, he owns the songs, he sings the songs. I mean, the only thing that isn't his is the check, as he said, when it goes to his wife. So, Oh, that's right. <laughs> and how it's spent. <laughs> it's important to go shopping, right? Yeah, it's definitely good. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I liked Aaron's music before. And I think after visiting with him here, I, I really became a fan of Aaron Watson. You know, along with this, there's been some news coming out about the NFR that obviously we'll cover as we keep going forward. I think the fans are, I mean, while we're not in Vegas, they're still in NFR and there's a lot more to come. Yeah, I'm excited to hear about that one. Yeah, I, uh, I think everybody is there, Mr. Goder. Want to experience more of NFR? Then visit nfrexperience.com. And we invite you to subscribe to NFR Extra on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you're listening right now. If you like what you've heard on NFR Extra, we would love it if you gave us a big five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe. Hi, I'm Boyd Paul Hamus, and you're listening to NFR Extra. South is the wind, you're bold enough to bless his name. A singer-songwriter, husband, father of three, and self-made musical success, the 41-year-old Texan has forged a slow and steady path to country stardom by both honoring tradition and embracing the unknown. Today, we learn a lot about Aaron Watson, from parenting tactics during the pandemic, musical influences, relationship with rodeo, and performing in Las Vegas. Aaron Watson, welcome to NFR Extra. Hey, thank you all for having me. Uh, well, it's our pleasure to have you, and uh, let's get this ball rolling. You know, there's uh, there's an old Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times. Aaron, how is your interesting time going during, well, this pandemic here? Oh, you know, it's uh, when you live in a little small town in Texas, you know, I kind of feel like half my life I'm, I'm quarantined anyways. You know, we live out in the middle of nowhere, and... Um, um, you know, this is just giving me more time to go fishing with my boys and my little girl. So, you know, I, I guess I could focus on the negative things like the fact that we've probably been forced to cancel 80 to a hundred shows and you could get out your calculator and start doing the math on how much money you've lost. And, um, you know, you could, you could focus on those things. Or you could say, you know what, this was a, uh, you know, involuntary vacation and let's make the most of it. And I, you know, I've had fun kind of getting back to the drawing board and going, okay, how am I going to be productive during 
uh, these times and you know, we do Zoom concerts. I do these cameo videos that I've been doing for the last three years. Um, I handwrite lyrics of mine on these eight by 10 canvases. And I think I've done coming up on about 500 of those um, canvases. So, you know, you just find ways to make ends meet. And at the end of the day, it's like, you know, I do whatever I had to do, whether that's cleaning toilets or yard work or, you know, you know, anything and everything. But um, these are crazy times, you know, and um, but I, I do think it's it's a little bit ignorant of our society to act like these are the first hard times that our country's endured. I mean, I, I love watching uh, the military channel and when you see what our country went th has gone through, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the world we live in. Right. So I think we just have to keep our chin up and keep moving forward and, you know, focus on the things that we can control. A lot of people that we have on here, whether it be rodeo contestants, musicians, anybody in the Western lifestyle just about says what you were just saying. And just this whole appreciating where you're at, what you're doing, and controlling what you can, and living the best. yeah. Well, you know, I think that's why I, I think that's why, you know, the Western world. The uh, I think that's why that's my clientele. You know, I think uh, that's why I fit in so well with the rodeos. You know, I think we've played the buckle ceremony at South Point for the last I don't know. It's been. 11, 12 years now. And, um, you know, that's what I love about the rodeo, you know, when, when you're kicking it off with the national anthem and a prayer, I mean, I, I just, I love, I love the heritage. I love the tradition. I love the patriotism. And, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I tell people, I don't care if you're left wing or right wing. We're Americans and we're on the same team. And there have been presidents that have been elected that I haven't voted for. And I have rooted for them, uh, you know, 110%. Because to root against your president is to root against your country. And, you know, that's my opinion. And not everybody, um, has those same opinions as me and that's okay. Uh, the fact is, is men and women have fought and died so that we can have these opinions. And, um, you know, but like here at my house, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't watch the news. My wife loves watching the news, but I've told her, I'm like, listen, when I come in the kitchen and you've got your news on, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it because it's discouraging and I can't control anything that is going on in Washington, DC. But what I can control is what's going on in my little world in West Texas. And, and I'm going to focus on the things that I can control, you know, and um, that's working hard and raising my kids. And, you know, I think if uh, everyone focused on their neighborhood, it would make the world a better place, like overnight. If you focused on your home, I think that's how you change the world, you know? That, that, that's, that's, how, that's how we're going to make the world a better place, honestly, is if we all focus more on our homes. Lead by example sort of a lifestyle. Yeah, you know, it's like, uh, you, know, we, you know, it's like my boys in these video games, uh, I walk in one day and they're playing some game and they're just, they're, they're shooting up people. And I was like, okay, I'm done with that, you know? And, um, and I was, and I was like, listen, I said, first of all, I said, boys, here's the facts. Girls at school, they're not going to like you because you're good at some stupid video game. <laughs> they're going to like you because, oh man, you know, 
he's a good football player or he's a good basketball player. He's a good baseball player. Or they're going to like you because you have like a legitimate skill. Like, Oh man, you know, Jake can play the guitar. Jack can play the guitar. Jack can do this. Jake can do that. I go, you're just wasting, you're wasting these moments, especially when these kids, you know, these kids at this age, they're sponges. They can learn so much. And I'm like, you guys are wasting these valuable moments of your life where you can learn all these skills and you're just, you're just frying your brain on these games. And, oh man, I go in there. I'm telling you, they still, I still give them a little bit of a time to play. It's very limited and controlled. I did put them up for the games up for like, I think, I think 14 or 15 months they went without them. And then during this pandemic, because they were driving me out of my mind at times, Mm -hmm. I just was like, get out of my face and go play your video games for a little bit. (laughs) And, uh, but here's the deal. If they, if they go past their time limit, I go in there, I'm like, okay, guys, we're done. And if they don't, I just go in there. I know the breaker in the garage to their room and I just flip the breaker off. I shut down the whole room and they're like, dad. (laughs) So it's a, it's like, it's proud. It's like a proud dad moment. It's something my dad would have done, you know, my, 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 you could just go behind the wall and unplug the TV, but it's just, it's so much cooler to flip the breaker. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of your dad and growing up and absorbing things, how did you get involved in the music industry and did your dad have a big influence on that? Yeah. You know, dad, my dad's a disabled veteran. He's a hundred percent disabled from, um, serving our country, uh, during the Vietnam war. And dad said that after he got injured, that music was really therapy for him. And dad was real into the, you know, the kind of the Texas outlaw movement, you know, Willie and Waylon. And, um, but then, you know, my dad was, you know, grew up loving the Beatles and the stones and, and my dad also loved like, you know, Sinatra and Dean Martin. And, and dad just has such a, my dad has just such a, such a great appreciation for music. So growing up, we were always listening to music. Um, you know, my dad, we had a custodial business. Um, and we, we, we cleaned our church and it didn't matter. I mean, anywhere we were cleaning, dad had his little radio battery powered radio. He had this dolly. He had, my dad had a dolly and there was a trash can that was strapped to that dolly with bungee cords. And then he had it rigged up where he could put all his cleaning supplies on this dolly. And, um, and then he had a hanger that basically tied that, that battery powered AM FM radio to the handle of the dolly. So we were always listening to music and anytime a song would come on, my dad could tell you what time, what year it came out, who the singer was, just all kinds of crazy facts. So the songwriters. And so dad gave me that great appreciation for music. And then there was mom that was always encouraging me to sing at church. Like when I say encouraging me to sing at church, like maybe thump me in the back of the head if I wasn't singing at church. So forcing me actually encouraging me by making me sing at church, which was, you know, that, that, both of them together really um, had a huge influence on my, my music career and, and, and the fact that they were so supportive of me, you know, from the beginning. So at what age was the beginning of, uh, you know, when you decided to pursue wanting to be a musician? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, probably like my senior year in high school, I really, really, I've always paid attention to lyrics. And I really started to, to, you know, write songs and I did all this like in secrecy in fear that my, if my buddies knew, they would be like, oh, that's cute. You're writing love songs. Oh, you know, because that's how my friends were. So I didn't really, you know, I I didn't really tell anybody that, you know, I'm learning to play the guitar and I'm writing songs. And, you know, back at that point, you know, I was, you know, I had all, I had, my dream was to be, you know, starting second baseman for the Houston Astros. So, I mean, I had different, (laughs) I had different plans for my life. 
back then, but that's kind of where the dream started. And then I got into college, played a little college baseball. And at that point I started picking up the guitar and taking lessons and, you know, just started honing my craft. And then I had an injury. I hurt my back and I couldn't play baseball anymore. And, you know, that was a, that was a tough thing for a, you know, for a kid his whole life who had just dreamed of playing baseball. And, but, you know, I had that guitar to fall back on. And I think that's when I really started putting all my energy towards my music. And, um, you know, I just, I, I did the, the same thing back then that I do now, you know, I just focus on one fan at a time. Uh, you know, just letting people know how much I appreciate them. Uh, you know, I, um, you know, I think in the beginning we all, every male country singer probably looks up to George Strait. If, if, I mean, they should, if they don't, then I, I have other thoughts on that. Um, but, you know, go, be, wanted to be like George Strait, you know, wanted to go to Nashville, get a record deal. And, you know, I just got shot down by every record label and it was very discouraging. And, you know, I remember coming home from a Nashville trip and telling my dad, you know, like these labels, they all say that I don't have what it takes. And I remember my dad just kind of laughed and he said, yeah, that's the same thing they said to Willie for all those years. And my dad said, you just need to make your music and play songs for people who want to hear you. And that's what started up my independent career. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've stayed, you know, I'm stubborn, but I've stayed true to that. And, uh, you know, we've had the fans have, have taken care of us. I mean, God's blessed us with the best fans. I mean, we put out our album, the underdog, it it became it was the first independent album in the history of country music to chart number one on Billboard. And man, I mean, what that I mean, that's such a blessing. I mean, and that's the thing is that like, you know, speaking of George, George Strait has like 60 something number ones and he's got this and he's got that. And God, who wouldn't want that? But I can say one thing that I've done that George hasn't done. I mean, we did it our way, all by ourselves. My record label, my publishing company, my band, just working hard, grinding it out year after year after year after year after year after year. You know, and then the next year we came out with another album called Vaquero. And um, our song Out of Style became, became the, only the third song in the history of the chart to chart top 10 independently. And people ask me, they're like, how, did, how have you done this all by yourself? And I'm like, well, it only took me 17 years to have my first top 10 single nationwide. I mean, 17 years. I was like, it only took us 17 years. And they're like, how did you do this? I was like, every night after, every night putting on the best show you can put on. And then after the show, you're not done working. You get, you get off that stage and you go hang out at your merch booth and you shake hands and you give hugs and you let the fans know how much you appreciate them. I'm like, that's how, that's how we've charted albums. Number one, independently, you know, it's now it's 20 years, 20 years of, of taking care of the fans. Cause you take care of the fans they take care of you. And I don't, I don't even consider them fans. They're more like family, you know? So, you know, we just, um, we just get out there and work hard and, and it's like we're doing right now. You know, we're starting to play a few shows here and there. I had a little, I had a couple of little shows this weekend, which was so nice. Cause I've just been, you know, doing other things for the last four or five months or whatever it's been. And, uh, but we're just getting right back at it, you know, and obviously things are different with social distancing, but uh, we got a new album coming out January or February called American soul. And we're just going to keep, you know, keep, keep doing the best that we can with the cards that were dealt like everyone. 20 years of hard work has paid off, Aaron. No doubt about it. Let's hit the pause button and take a quick break. 
And we'll be back in a few moments to talk about how that hard work has led to the Texas Cowboy Hall of Fame. Never going out of style. I was thinking, wow, the sun is sinking low. We can go all night. Never going out of style. Looking to rope in some news and features you can't find anywhere else? Then look no further than the series of blogs and vlogs at nfrexperience.com. You'll find customized content from experts in all things rodeo and Las Vegas. There's the NFR Insider and Stock Blog with Susan Canode, Hurley's Hotspot and Heart of the NFR with Brian Herbert, The Road to the NFR with Mr. Dale Brisby, NFR Experience with Patrick Everson, and the Junior World Finals with Jack Nallen. There's something for all rodeo fans. Check it out at the newly redesigned NFRExperience.com. This is the NFR. This is Vegas. Hi, I'm world champion Jacob Scrawley, and you're listening to NFR Extra. Chase gold buckles and guitars. I don't do it for the money. I can't blame the fame. It's been a long, hard ride. Still, I we are kicking it with singer songwriter Aaron Watson. Aaron's hit song, That Look, was on his 2015 album, The Underdog, which debuted at number one on the Top Country Albums chart, making him the first independent male artist to hit the top of the chart with a self-released and independently promoted album. Clearly, you've been doing this for 20 years. And understanding that you're an artist and the process that you know every artist takes to producing something, writing music, uh, playing it, do you still approach the same way you did 20 years ago, the way you do today? making your music? Um, no, it's much different. You know, I think I, I come into the studio way more prepared and I have, you know, I, I just, you know, it, I can go back and listen to some of my old songs and go, Oh, I can't believe I did that there or that or that, or I should have done this or I should have done that. But you know, I can honestly say every step along the way, it was my best effort, but you get, you grow and you get better. And, you know, uh, you, you also, you know, I think your style evolves, you know, every once in a while, you know, it's like on our, our red, our latest album, red bandana, we have a couple of songs that are really rocking, you know, and, and if you just listen to those couple of songs, you would think, oh man, is he making more of a pop country album? Well, no. Go listen to the other 20 track. There's 20 songs on that album. And I mean, the album starts off with a cowboy poem. And then the second song on the album is a Western, spaghetti Western style instrumental. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, if you're going to go pop country, you don't start your album off with a cowboy poem and then go into a Western instrumental. That's not how you start off a pop country record, but you know, I write what I, what I feel and it's fun to sometimes push the limits and give the fans some different flavors. And, uh, but I definitely, I'm still, even now after all these years searching for ways to be more creative you know, when it comes to the studio, I mean, I really, the songwriting process, the studio stuff, it really is. It's something that I just absolutely live for. It's so exciting. You're talking about the red bandana album. What's the, what's the symbolization or, you know, the, the, where did that come from? Well, you know, I just think the red bandana signifies a lot of things in the cowboy world, you know, it's, it's, um, I think it hard work, you know, I mean, you know, you think about all those cowboys are, they're wearing those bandanas to wipe the sweat from their brow, you know, to, uh, you know, if you're out riding and it's a windy day and there's dirt flying everywhere, cover your face, 
I mean, it's the original, uh, you know, face covering, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it is, I, you know, it, there's been several times I'm out and about and I'm like, crud, I forgot my stupid mask. And I'm like, oh, wait, I got a bandana, you know? So it's, uh, you know, I just think it, it's very cowboy. And, um, you know, I just thought it was that the song red bandana is a, uh, there, there, there's two songs. They go together, uh, back to back. And the first one's called riding with red. And it's a song that I wrote for red Stegall, who is one of my heroes. And I wrote that song for red. And after riding with red ends, it goes into the song red bandana. And it's really just a tribute to red and that generation of cowboy. And, um, you know, I, I, I just, I love red. He's so good to me and my family and my kids love him. And, you know, the whole Western world loves red. So it was a real honor for me to just kind of lift him up in song. You're also, as you've come along with your career, the music industry has changed as you were coming in. Napster was happening. Music artists. Oh yeah. Right. About what was happening to digital music. How has streaming music clearly when we're talking about your new album here, how has that helped out your career and and what are your thoughts on streaming music and how is it tied to success? It's interesting. You know, um, as far as my record sales, it has devastated record sales. I mean, I don't know. You know, it's like, it really, we floored people with our success of of the underdog. I mean, I think it sold 26,000 records the first week. And then the Vaquero album, when we came out with Vaquero, a lot of our friends in the industry were like, listen, record sales are down 50% since you came out with your underdog record. So if you could just do you know, 12, 13,000 records, that would be a huge success for y'all. And we came out with Vaquero and we sold like 40,000 records. And it just blew people's minds that while record sales were going down, we continued to sell. We, we were kind of defying gravity. Um, but we really saw it finally settle in with my fans Uh, when the red bandana came out and I don't know, I think we sold maybe 12,000 copies of that. I mean, so you think about just the decline in record sales from 2017 to 2019. It was just, it's, if you don't evolve with the changes, it could be absolutely devastating, but, we we have always evolved with the industry you know we're that's one thing i think that a reason i think there's a reason why a lot of these record labels are struggling today it's because they're still running a business using an old model and uh so we you know we're i'm fortunate that i own my records i'm fortunate that i wrote every song i wrote every song all by myself on red bandana so when they're sending out those royalty checks for, you know, streaming, you know, the, it, you know, all, all the, the proceeds from that go straight into my wife's purse. You know, it's like, I, I don't get paid, but she does, she gets it all. So it works out really good for her, but that's a whole, that's a different segment. Um, that might be, that we might need, that might need to be a different phone call, but it's, It has been, it's pretty crazy. I don't remember all the numbers, but you know, you, you can say, Oh man, we just had a million streams on this song this week. And then you're like, okay, well that's barely enough to buy you a burger. And, And that's, what's crazy because when you say the word million, it's, it's huge, right? Like when you hear the word million, you're thinking, Whoa, wow. A million. But that's just, it's kind of, that number has changed, you know, a million, you know, doesn't get you what it used to get you. 
I mean, it still gets you a lot in West Texas, I bet. But, um, but you know, it, it, it's definitely t- times have changed and you embrace it. And I mean, I'll be honest, I love it. I love, I love streaming music. I love it. I mean, if there's pros and cons to it, but as a, as a consumer, as a listener, I mean, gosh, back in the day, you know, when I was a kid, you know, CDs cost 15 bucks. And if you wanted to hear it, you know, you, you didn't, you weren't able to, now you could burn CDs and do some stuff like that. If your buddies had one and you know, you could, you know, cassette tapes and do stuff like that. But now I do think there's some pros in it because think of all the kids that have access to my music that otherwise would have never known about me had it not been for the the way music is streamed now. So you have to, you know, you, you got to look at the pros and the cons. And, um, you know, I, I think I think in the end it's it's going to be, it, I think it's a good thing for sure. Imagine your dad's playlist uh, that he'd create with all that music you rattling off when, uh, when clean. Uh, oh man. Oh, he's so funny now. I mean, when I moved mom and dad from their house in town to be out here near us in the country, little farmhouse. And God, my dad had like hundreds of cassette tapes and I was like, Dad, you just need to throw these away. I guarantee you, they don't even play anymore. Oh, I'm gonna get around to listening to them. I go, no, you're, I, you know. So when I moved them, I, I probably, you know, I probably threw away about twenty thousand pounds of junk from their old house. I was like, uh, uh-uh, uh, we're not doing this, Dad. And I said, listen, Dad. I go, there's this new thing called Alexa. Oh, I just said it. And she turned on here at the house, which is creepy. Um, I said, she'll play any music you want. And dude, it cracks me up. I mean, half the time he can't get her name right. And it's just, you want some just good entertainment. My dad, the first, uh, I think one time he called her Alice. I mean, it was like Alice play the beach boys. And I'm like, that's not her name, dad. You know, Lexi play the play Willie Nelson, redheaded stranger. And I'm, he's like, why won't she play it? I go, you know what? If you call a woman by the wrong name, you're going to get nowhere with her. It's just, it's fact of life, dad. You got to call her the right name. It's funny. But, um, you know, he, he enjoys it now. I mean, he enjoys just being able to, listen to anything you want. So I've enjoyed watching him kind of embrace modern technology. But, you know, I, of course he gave me all his vinyl records and I listen to vinyl records all the time. I have a record player on my bus. And after every show, I just love to kind of just kick my, kick my boots off and put on a old record and just chill out. Joining the Texas Cowboy Hall of Fame, class of 2020, inducted in January. What did this mean for your career? More importantly, what did it mean to you? Oh, gosh. I, that still just doesn't seem real to me. Um, such an honor. I mean, I don't feel worthy of it, um, to be honest with you. Um, but I'm just so gracious and so thankful. And I think it was... You know, it was neat to um, experience that with my family. It was really, they made it a really, really, really special evening. Uh, Getting to see, getting to have my mom and dad there. Uh, Red Stegall was there, getting to have Red there. Uh, It was just an honor. It's one of those things that, you know, those are one of those deals. You just say, thank you so much. You give all the glory to God. You know, you just try to enjoy, enjoy the moment. And of course it was down, you know, in the stockyards in Fort Worth and I love that area and it was fun. And, uh, it was just, it was really special. It was a really, really, really special evening. You know, I love, I mean, my favorite shows are, you know, fairs and rodeos. I love the kids. I love, you know, there's nothing better than watching the rodeo than getting to play a show afterwards. And 
you know, that's, that's the thing. I, I, you know, I tell people everywhere I go, I'm like, I promise you this. I'm one of the, the, I'm telling you for your fans, for your rodeo fans, I'll give them the show that they want. You know, I play, I got a lot of songs about rodeo and I sure enough know how to mix in some Chris Ledoux and George Strait. So there you go. You know, so that there's my shameless plug to all the rodeos around America. Like, you know, call me up, you know, we'll put on a, we'll put you on a show. I just love it. That's awesome, man. That's yeah. That's, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity that you get to experience on that. It really was. It was amazing. And you know, it, it's just one of those things I, I have, I have no, you can't explain just the honor. It's just like, it's one of those deals. I just still don't feel worthy of it, but it was a special moment that I, I will forever be grateful for. It feels as though your career is just getting started, even if it's taken 20 years. All right, let's break right there though. After the break, Aaron shares with us how he uses music as a platform to lift people going through tough times. Want to relive the best NFR moments from the last 35 years? We've got you covered at NFRExperience.com. Check out the NFR History tab at the newly redesigned website for a walk, or should we say a gallop, down memory lane. You'll find images, recaps, and videos from the greatest moments from the last 35 years in Las Vegas. From Ty Murray to Trevor Brazil, Louis Field to Casey, Charmaine James to Mary Berger, Fred Whitfield to Joe Beaver, and everything in between, you'll find it here. There's something for all rodeo fans. Check it out at the newly redesigned NFRExperience.com. This is NFR. This is Vegas. Hi, I'm Haley Kinsel, and you're listening to NFR Extra. In the rain, in the mud, in July, in Cheyenne They had to carry away that brave young man Aaron Watson is here on NFR Extra. A portion of the sales from his tribute album, Aaron Watson Live, at the world's biggest rodeo show, was donated to the Rebuild Texas Fund for families in the Texas community impacted by Hurricane Harvey. So I had to, uh, it's kind of interesting, a few years back, my son, he's five, and I, I was watching eight seconds, like on one winter, you know, day, and yeah, that kid just put it on loop, and put it on loop, and now, you know, 31 years past Lane's death, uh, you know, on social media, it's like the, the people still remembering him, and, and, you know, putting up all the Lane Frost brand stuff, but that song, yeah. July and Cheyenne, I mean, that's like, that's a, that's a pretty powerful song to a lot of us that you know kind of grew up watching him and idolizing lane frost what was your inspiration on creating that song oh man it's a special song to me um i wrote it for lane's mom and when i wrote it i honestly had no plans of ever singing that for anybody i it did not even cross my mind um I wrote that song. That was the first song that I wrote after my wife and I lost our little girl, Julia Grace. Um, we lost Julia shortly after she was born. Oh, and I held that baby girl in my arms as she slipped away. And I just struggled with a lot of things after that. I mean, I still struggle with things. And um, I'd be lying to you if I said that I didn't. And it's not, it's not like my faith wasn't shook. I wasn't mad at God. You know, I, I let people know, like, I, you know, as a Christian, I understand that this world is full of pain and heartache. I mean, none of us are immune to the hardships of this world. And so you can't be mad at God when this life does what it does. And I said, as a Christian, I, we, we, we believe that Jesus came to this world and gave his life to free us from 
the, the pain and the suffering that we know that, you know, while we're here, um, those things can get very difficult. We know that we have hope in something better. And um, that's kind of what inspired the song July and Cheyenne because Lane's mama, Miss Elsie, she has said a lot of different things. She uses his, she uses their heartache and the loss of Lane's life as a way to share her love for Jesus. And that's what she was doing. And, you know, basically she said that, you know, Lane was a world champion bull rider, but that wasn't his greatest achievement. She said his greatest achievement came a year before he died when he asked Jesus to be his savior. And I just needed to be reminded in that dark moment that, you know what? this world is not my home and that I will get to see that little girl again someday. And I, I just wanted to write her a song. Um, and honestly, I just, I was just a dad that just lost his baby girl. And I just poured my heart into that song. And I, I, uh, I need to ask her, you know, that's, I haven't thought about this. I need to ask her if she still has the the CD of the acoustic version I did. I think I just recorded it on a little microphone at the house. And um, it, several months later, um, the San Antonio Rodeo asked me to play their cowboy church service one Sunday. And they asked me to do this, you know, to sing this, some praise songs and some of my songs. And, uh, uh, my buddy, Trevor Brazil gave the message and he did a little preaching and, um, right then and there, just out of nowhere, I had no plans on singing that song. And I decided to just sing the song. I think I even messed it up, which would really bothered me that I messed the song up. And then I remember thinking, wait, Nobody even knows the song, so they don't even know that I messed up the words. It really cracked me up that I was upset with myself for messing up the song. And then I was like, wait, I'm the only one in the world that knows the song. And, um, but afterwards, people came up to me and kept asking me about the song. And the man who um, owned the bull that Lane was, was riding on uh, when he passed away, he was there. And he came up to me and he just had tears rolling down his cheek and just said, thank you for that song. And uh, I was recording an album at the time and I was like, oh man, I just, something inside of me said, you got to put this song on your album, which sounds silly now. It's one of my mo most popular songs. It sounds silly that I didn't even, I wasn't considering it. I just, that's not where my mind was at the time. It was a gift for Lane's mom. And, uh, but thank you for bringing that up that I love talking about that song because it gives me an opportunity to share my faith, you know? And, um, so thank you all for, for bringing that up. Aaron, I, first of all, you're talking to, to two dads as well and, and a daughter of a father. So, I mean, that was some pretty powerful stuff, man. I thank you for, thanks buddy. You bet. You know, rodeo is, there's a lot of life in rodeo and uh, oh yeah, you're a big part of it. Where does rodeo fit in your universe? You know, when, when did it start? When did you start becoming a part of rodeo? Because you're clearly a part of it. You know, I mean, I, I, I didn't have the opportunity growing up to be, to be involved with the rodeo. Um, there just weren't those opportunities for me. I mean, it's, you know, I think just, it's just, you know, not all kids, ha it, it, not all kids have that wonderful opportunity even like mine to have horses i mean it's really such a blessing for kids to to grow up in the country and to be surrounded with animals and you know chickens and livestock and it, you know there's nothing like it it's how 
I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the reason why it was important to me to, to raise my kids out in the country, just appreciate the stars at night, <laughs> the sunrise on the horizon, the sunsets, um, you know, and so it's something that I always wanted. You know, I had a cousin who was a, a bull rider and I always thought it was just really cool. Um, I, I, I rode a bull once in junior college. Um, and, and that was, that was enough of that. Um, that was enough of that for me. And, uh, probably, probably would have got a, we, we would have gotten kicked out of school had they known that we did that after hours on a Friday night night, you know, um, probably something I probably shouldn't even talk about because my mom might hear this interview. Um, but it was, uh, I just realized it's been years and years and years and years and years ago that my music without even trying just was a great soundtrack for not just the rodeo, but it's fans and you find your niche and I love, I love everything about the rodeo. I love the contestants. I love the fans. I love the personalities. I love what they stand for, the work ethic, uh, their appreciation for God and country and family. And, um, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I want. I just want, I want to be that guy that just, you know, anytime there's a rodeo, big or small, and they need a, a band, I just want to be that guy. I mean, it's, it's, I don't want, I don't want to, you know, I'm not, I don't want, you know, entertainer of the year at the CMA or ACM awards. I don't care about that stuff. I just, I enjoy playing music for the rodeo fans. I just, I love it. I love the kids. I love the atmosphere. It's, it's truly, it's truly my favorite experience when it comes to music. Not speaking for the rodeo industry, but I don't think I'd get an argument either that they are blessed to have you, Aaron. We'll stop right there. When we return, we're talking Vegas and the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo. Do you need a dose of social? A dash of insider info? Then the National Finals Rodeo social network is set up just for you. Get updates, insights, unique content, and much more on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. You can find us at Las Vegas NFR. And be sure to use hashtag Wrangler NFR on your post and tweets. There's something for all rodeo fans. This is the NFR. This is Vegas. Hi, I am Benny Butler, and you're listening to NFR Extra. Fifty-eight lost their lives, mothers and fathers, husbands and wives. We are back with Aaron Watson. The past nine years, Aaron has become a regular in Las Vegas during the Wrangler NFR. From kicking off the rodeo at the downtown hoedown, entertaining the gold buckle crowd at South Point, to performing at the sold-out Thomas and Mack Center. Speaking of country music, all of the fans and everything that you've been involved with, I do want to touch a little bit on Las Vegas Route 91 and your song 58 that has some extremely powerful emotions. What inspired you? What was important about this song? Well, um, after one of my shows at uh, South Point um, a few months after that, that tragedy, um, there were um, two girls who were there um, during the, uh, the shooting and we played the festival the year before. And I remember after my set, you know, when you play some of those huge, you know, if I'm playing a rodeo or a, you know, fair or honky tonk or dance hall after my show, if I come out there into the crowd, um, 
I, I, you know, I can't, I will just, it'll be nothing but taking selfies for the next two hours. But on those big things, I can kind of sneak out there with the fans and just enjoy the show. And I mean, I was literally right up there, you know, watching Brad Paisley play that night. And it was on the, it was the last night of the festival. And it just made me go, oh my goodness, had just been a year later, I'm, you know, I could have been a fatality. And these two girls, one of the girls um, had been shot in the leg and was in a wheelchair. And I literally found out about a month ago that she passed away from complications with her injury. And she and her friend, they said, you should write a song for the families who lost loved ones. And I said, okay. And I said, I'll try. And I woke up the next morning there at the casino hotel. And, um, I had those words on my mind and I got up and I I literally just wrote the song, you know, and I just wanted to be kind of a, a song where, um, people who, who were grieving could find some comfort and just be acknowledged that we're still thinking about them. I think that's the most important thing. You know, tragedies happen. It makes front page news, you know, and then a week goes by and we forget about it. But those people who are affected by it have to live with it every day. So I just wanted to make a special song, you know, I, Music, my goal for music is to make music that uplifts people, make, put smiles on faces. And so that was an honor for me to be able to write that song. It's an honor to listen to it. I will say it, it does just that. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Rue 91 was pretty close to us, uh, for us folks at Las Vegas events. You know, we're pretty tied into the, well, the Western lifestyle and definitely when it comes to live music. And we had a lot of, I can tell you this, Aaron, we had, friends that worked in the production side to the promoting side yeah. that were there and uh, uh, a nightmare. Yeah, totally was. But you know, I had my booking agent was there. I had friends there. I mean, just, just a nightmare, just an absolute nightmare. But at the same time, I, you know, this is kind of turning a different mm-hmm. way things through and you're proving that in this conversation. I mean, there's the tra- tragic times, tough times, sad times. Uh, we all rise to the ashes, right? And um, Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I think, it, 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 you know, I, 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 I like watching, if I watch any news, I like watching BBC, like worldwide news. Because it's really interesting for me to see what's happening in other parts of the world. And I'm telling you, um, America, we, we have not shown a very good, we've not shown much appreciation for what we have been blessed with in this country. And we're not perfect. We're not perfect. And there are, there are, um, there, there are scars that I'm ashamed of when it comes to this country. And there are um, inequalities that I'm, that I'm not proud of. And the problem is that the way we deal with things and, you know, it's, we live in a society where, you know, people are mad for being disrespected. So what they do is they disrespect others. You know, it's like there's, we, we, we've forgotten the golden rule of do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And, you know, I just think we need to just, um, we need to just focus on kindness and love and sound simple, but, you know, I just don't get wrapped up in political things. I mean, it's really kind of silly. I don't, I don't, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not trying to, I don't get too political, but it's like, you know, 
this guy doesn't like this president. And I'm like, well, I can understand where you're coming from, but why don't you look at the other guy that's running against him? I'm like, sometimes these, 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 polit- these politicians, they're just different dude. They're the same dude wearing a different tie. I mean, don't, we don't need to put our trust in, in the government for crying out loud, you know, focus on your home, focus on the things that we've been talking about this whole interview. So I don't know. I'm just ready. I'm really ready for 2021 and I might want to just go ahead and skip to 2022 if that's possible. You think we could just roll the clock forward a whole nother year? I mean, ma'am. Ben, the Benjamin Button style, though, so don't you, you don't lose anything. You like gain some ground when you do that. <laughs> Absolutely, I just think that'd be a great idea. You know, I'm hoping when that ball drops at New Year, people are like, "Okay, let's hit the reset button." And you know, sometimes you got to do that. I've done that with with buddies. Like, we just at some point have to go. You know what? I don't agree with you. And if we keep talking about this, we're kicking a dead horse and we're just going to continue going down this path. Let's just hit the reset button and, you know, talk about something else. And that's really what we need to do. We need to hit the reset button. Well, speaking about something else, let's, let's, let's end on this one, Aaron, because this is what we're talking about our home here at Las Vegas, which seems to be your home in December. Love it. What's that long run at South Point, man? What's that all about for you and NFR and rodeo? It's fun. And, dude, it's hard. I do not know how the contestants, the vendors, everyone that works in the rodeo up there for three straight weeks. I mean, for me, it's challenging because, I mean, I finally had to tell my wife a couple of years ago, I was like, you're killing me. You're literally killing me in Vegas. I'm going to die in Las Vegas if you don't stop asking me to get up early and take you shopping. Like I'm going to die because what's going, what's happening is I play the buckle ceremonies, which means I usually get on stage at like, I play my show at 12 or 1230 at night which is basically two or two 30, you know, Texas time. And my wife doesn't stay up for the shows because she's tired. So she goes to bed early and then she would wake me up in the morning and go, Hey, I wanted you to go walk around with me. And I just finally was like, "Uh uh-uh, no, I'm becoming, it's like, I'm not 25 anymore. I was like, you've, I've got to pace myself. And I do, I have to pace myself for those shows and make sure that I get plenty of rest and the dry climate. I have to drink water. I have to religiously make myself drink water. Like I about have to make a, put a, 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 a alarm on my phone, like stop and drink water. But it's exciting, um, you know, getting to see, you know, different friends, you know, the guys that, you know, I, I, I don't get to see a lot of those rodeo, a lot of, a lot of my rodeo buddies like Shane Hanchy or, you know, Tough Cooper or, or you know, uh, Luke Branquino or any of the, all. Oh, there's so many, there's just so many great personalities. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's exciting. It's for me, it's a treat. It's usually my last shows of the year before Christmas break. And, um, so I don't know. I just enjoy it. I mean, I'm telling you, I usually, I'll go catch the rodeo a couple times, but honestly, I love sitting at the South point casino in my room. I order room service and I watch the rodeo on TV. I'll go a couple of times, but I love watching it on TV. And, um, and then going and playing the show and just, you know, there's just excitement, you know, I, 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 there's just so much excitement. People are just, people just have a great time. Just great people. Great people. Man, Aaron, this was uh, what a way to start off a morning hanging out with you 
This is uh, Phil. Uh, for me personally, this was super blessed to kind of have this conversation with you. Oh man, thank you for having me. I'm sorry that my my uh, Zoom uh, video thing isn't. I, I've got we've got an internet guy coming out uh, at noon because I'm supposed to do some of these Zoom concerts tonight. And when you live out in the middle of the country and you have bad cell service, you've got to have some. Uh, you know, it's it's. I'm having some serious technical issues but man thank y'all for having me and if y'all ever need to burn up time and you need someone to just talk your ear off y'all call me up anytime mm, sounds good to me absolutely thank so, you so much for joining us you bet i hope to see y'all soon in las vegas i'm missing it well thank you sir uh have a good week thank y'all yeah god bless you too y'all be blessed We want to thank Aaron Watson for sharing his stories on NFR Extra. And stay tuned for episode 63 when George Taylor, Brittany Posey Tanazi, and more join NFR Extra to talk about the 2020 Wrangler NFR. Want to experience more of the NFR? Then visit NFRExperience.com. And we invite you to subscribe to NFR Extra on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or wherever you're listening right now. If you like what you've been hearing on NFR Extra, we would love it if you gave us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe. NFR Extra. All dirt. All rodeo. All year. Gotta make it out to Vegas Where the big boys roam With the rovers and the racers And the bulls and the browns And the ladies in